everyone, and thank you for participating in the New Jersey Statewide Network for Cultural Competence webinar. The NJSNCC includes a network of over 130 organizations and agencies, and its mission is to facilitate access to equitable and quality services for individuals, families, and communities through culturally and linguistically appropriate service delivery. One of our activities is to offer webinars on a variety of topics in the fall and in the spring. Today's webinar's title is Immigrant Integration, a Challenge for Our Time. This presentation will discuss the meaning of immigrant, immigrant integration, why it is deserving of careful attention by policymakers and practitioners, how the U.S. compares to other countries in its integration outcomes, and what policies and practices show promise of fostering immigrant inclusion and participation. My name is Andrea O'Neill, and I am the State Coordinator for New Jersey Project Launch, linking actions for the unmet needs in children's health in the New Jersey Department of Children and Families Office of Early Childhood Services. And I will be the moderator for this webinar. Before I begin, I would like to address a few housekeeping items. Because of the number of participants, your telephone lines will be muted throughout the call. However, using the webinar technology, you can submit questions at any point during the presentation via the chat or questions box on your webinar console. You can send questions at any time during the presentation. I will compile your questions, which will be addressed at the end of the session. We also take a brief moment to address any questions uh, midway through the presentation. Please note that we may not be able to pose every question in the to the presenter and may combine some questions. Additionally, this webinar will be recorded and archived in the NJSNCC website. Finally, a short survey will pop up on your screen immediately following the webinar. Your feedback is important to us and we appreciate you taking the time to fill it out. Now I'm honored to introduce our speaker for today, Nicholas V. Montalto, PhD, President of Diversity Dynamics, LLC, and who has many years of experience working with and for immigrants in New Jersey. He has served as CEO of the International Institute of New Jersey, President of the New Jersey Association for Lifelong Learning, and Chair of the Board of Directors of the New Jersey Immigration Policy Network. Nick, you can begin. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. Um, this is a topic that is very often overlooked uh, in all of the heated discussion that takes place on immigration policy, but uh, I believe it's deserving of very careful attention. Uh, regardless of the number of immigrants admitted to the United States or the ethnic composition of those immigrants, the integration process can be handled well, uh, it can be handled poorly, or has, a, has often been the case in this country, it can be just plain ignored. I, I think we do that as our, at our peril as a nation when you consider the fact that we have over 42 million immigrants in the United States representing 13.3% of the population. This is a big, a big issue uh, that we will need to return to as a nation. I'm going to begin with uh, some attempt at definition. Uh, although we're using uh, the term immigrant integration, um, it doesn't mean that there aren't other words and phrases that we could use to describe uh, this goal. In fact, policymakers and academics have used many different terms uh, to describe either the process or the goal of immig immigrant integration. And uh, I've uh, assembled a few of them here, Americanization, immigrant assimilation, immigrant acculturation, incorporation, inclusion, and the term we're using today, immigrant integration integration. One can easily raise objections to some of these terms and indeed scholars and policymakers 
have debated the suitability and meaning of terms like assimilation and acculturation for many, many years. Adding to the confusion is whether or not we're referring to integration as a process or as a goal. In other words, is integration something we do or something we strive to achieve? The truth of the matter is that it is both, but in this webinar, we're going to focus on integration as a process and leave speculation as to the final goal to others, maybe the social philosophers. Let me give you a few examples of uh, definitions of immigrant integration. This is the first one I'll share with you, and it was developed in Europe to govern integration work there. Uh, it kind of has the virtue of simplicity. It uses the key word of inclusion and emphasizes the fact that integration uh, is both institutional and social in nature. It talks about institutional integration and social integration. Here's another one that was used in a recent National Academy study of immigrant integration in the United States. This definition suggests that the elimination of differences between immigrants and the U.S. born would be a good way to measure the progress of integration. Uh, for example, one could look at income levels of immigrants compared to more established residents. Or you could look at health care coverage or home ownership or education level. So this is another possible definition. Now here's a third definition that was developed by a group called Grant Makers Concern with Immigrants and Refugees. This is an affinity group of uh, foundations interested in immigration issues. Uh, you very often see this defi definition, especially, uh, it's especially popular among immigrant advocates. The key phrase in this definition is two-way process. In other words, immigrants change as they adapt to a new society, and everyone else changes as they adapt to immigrants. And we end up with, as this phrase suggests, a new whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. I want you to look at this one carefully because I'm going to kind of test your memory in just a moment. And finally, I'm going to share with you a fourth possible definition. And for the moment, I'm not going to reveal the author of this definition. And, and it says integration is the full participation of immigrants in the social, cultural, economic, and political life of the larger community. Uh, let's have a little fun now. Recognizing that there probably really isn't any wrong or right answer, I thought it would be interesting to get your input on uh, the best defin definition of immigrant integration. So we're going to stop and we're going to conduct an online poll. Uh, we've had to shorten the definitions because of character limitations, but uh, hopefully we've retained the essence of each definition. We're asking you now just to take a few, a few seconds and vote for the definition that you like best. Okay, uh, hopefully we have gotten some sense. We'll hear the results on your screen. Uh, it looks like there's a decided preference for either the, thor the third or the fourth definition. Um, I'm happy that you've chosen, many of you have chosen the fourth definition because that's the one that I composed myself. 
but uh, let me give you uh, my thinking about these definitions and bearing in mind that each definition probably has value in specific situations. I thought the first definition uh, doesn't kind of allow for measurement. In other words, how much inclusion would be regarded as sufficient to achieve integration. It's also a pretty safe definition, not likely to ruffle any feathers. The second definition kind of creates the impression that the eradication of differences is the ideal when actually we may be strengthened by our, our differences. The third defer, definition, which many of you liked, is wonderfully aspirational, but I thought it's a bit controversial. It suggests that immigrant integration doesn't just transform immigrants, it transforms all of us. I happen to like this definition, actually, because I think it's historically accurate. I think as we have evolved as a nation, we have been learning from and adapting to each new wave of immigrants. But it kind of leaves us in the lurch as to how we actually go about assessing our progress in integrating immigrants. So I see uh, some benefits to the fourth definition in that we can act, actually measure participation. It's a word that lends itself to measurement. And the fourth definition recognized that integration takes place over various domains, social, cultural, economic, and political. And I think most of the experts in this area would probably agree that in order to get a sense of how immigration, how integration is progressing, we have to look over various uh, domains. So thank you for participating in this uh, little poll, and uh, thanks for many of you agreeing with my definition. But as I said, there really is no right or wrong answer here. Um, before we get to the various arenas in which integration is pursued, let's talk a little bit about the importance of this topic. Why is immigrant integration important? Let's begin with numbers. This is a chart that shows the total number of new legal immigrants who declared New Jersey to be their state of intended residence for the 15-year period beginning in 2000 and ending in 2014, the last year for which numbers are available. You'll notice that during this period, we averaged close to 54,000 new legal immigrants per, per year. And even after the Great Recession of 2008, there really wasn't any significant slackening of new arrivals. So, over the, this period of 15 years, over 800,000 new legal immigrants entered New Jersey, making this state one of the most immigrant-rich states in the nation. In this slide, you can see the 15 states with the highest shares of immigrants to total population and how their relative position has changed at three points in time, 1990, 2000, and 2012. If you see a green line connecting the boxes, it means the state has risen in ranking. An orange line indicates the state has declined in ranking. You'll notice that New Jersey, which was fifth in ranking in 1990, with 12.5% of its population immigrant, has risen to third in ranking in 2012 with 21.2% .2 of its population immigrant. So integration is a goal that's vitally important to New Jersey, given its composition, and its population composition, and its tendency to serve as a magnet for new immigrants. Let me now suggest a few other compelling reasons why I think it behooves, behooves us to work on immigrant integration, beginning with national security. 
uh, this is, of course, a very hot topic today. And there have been several times in our history when the presence of foreigners in American society has sparked concerns, whether legitimate or not, that immigrants could undermine national unity. Maybe they might sabotage the war effort or engage in terrorist acts. I'm thinking, for example, of the persecution of Germans and other immigrants prior to World War I, the post-World War, World War I Red Scare, the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, and today's worries about Muslim immigrants and refugees. To the extent that immigrants retain loyalties to foreign governments or ideologies, then these loyalties could motivate them to take actions to frustrate or impede American foreign policy or worse yet, engage in terrorist acts. There's pretty universal ag agreement, however, that integration would be the best antidote to any such danger, that integration promotes common purpose and loyalty to America. Immigrant integration is also a vital strategy for avoiding intergroup tensions and conflict. When people come from diverse cultures, religions, races, and backgrounds, the potential for misunderstanding and conflict is great. In order to transcend these differences, efforts should be undertaken to build what the sociologists call bridging social capital, or opportunities from pe for people from diverse backgrounds to meet, interact, learn from one another, and achieve great things together. Immigrant integration is also important from an eco economic standpoint. Most people don't realize how critical immigrants are to the health of the economy as a whole. There are a number of demographic realities that this country has to contend with in the years to come. First, the falling birth rate. Last year, the birth rate of 60 per thousand women of childbearing age was the lowest in the history of our country. Some people are referring to this as, as the baby bust. This is part of a trend all over the developing world. In fact, in most European countries, the birth rate has fallen to below replacement levels. Now, there's something of a double whammy occurring. Not only are birth rates low, but the baby boomers are retiring en masse creating vacancies for jobs in many fields and placing added strain on the Social Security Trust Fund and Medicare, which will need many more workers to pay into the system to sustain it in the future. Just to give you one example, Healthcare New Jersey projects a shortfall of 40,000 nurses in New Jersey by the year 2020. Um, education is also impact with serious uh, shortages, especially in recruiting science and math teachers. The good news here is that immigrants can help fill the, vo the void, especially, especially if we take labor, labor market needs into account when we set admission policy and if we give immigrants the tools to succeed in our economy. Finally, immigrant integration is consistent with our values as a nation, treating people with dignity and respect, no matter what their ethnic, racial, or religious background, ensuring equality of opportunity for all, and embracing our differences as a resource for the nation as a whole. Now, let's kind of stop for a moment and take a look at how well we have done as a nation in integrating immigrants into our society. Um, there are several groups that have tried to measure the effectiveness of immigrant integration efforts. Perhaps the most ambitious and the most far-flung is something called the Migration Integration Policy Index, or MIPEX which was developed by a Brussels-based organization called the Migration Policy Group and funded by the European Union. MIPEX covers all of the member states of the European Union as well as 
many non-EU countries, including Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and yes, the United States, for a grand total of 38 countries. MIPEX looks at outcomes, but also looks at areas of policy and practice that it feels would, will produce favorable results. I've listed on this slide the eight policy areas. You see them listed there, labor market, mobility, education, political participation, et cetera. And there are 167 indicators of effectiveness. Now, any idea how well the U.S. does in the MIPEX index? Let's play a little game and see if you can predict where the United States stands in this international ranking. Are we second among the 38 countries, ninth, 18th, or 34th? I'm giving you those four choices. Let's see what you think as to where the United States ranks. Okay, I think we can now look at the results. Aha, uh -huh, so I see we have 11% said second place, 36th ninth place, 36% 18th, and 18% 34th. Well, the correct answer is, and let me get it up on the screen if I can. You'll see that here are the scores for the top 13 countries out of the 38. And congratulations to those of you who selected ninth because the United States does rank ninth. Somewhat disappointing considering our reputation as the major immigrant and refugee receiving nation in the world. However, the good news is we did go from 10th to 9th place since the last MIPEX evaluation in 2010. However, countries like Sweden and Portugal score 10 points higher than the United States, and Germany has been rising fast in the standing. It's now one point below the United States in 10th place. We don't have time to review all the factors that contributed to our overall score, but i just give you a few things that um, pull this down in the ranking. Uh, one, cons one concern was the high cost of filing a citizenship application. In the United States, it cost $680, whereas the average among, among all of the countries is $300. We also didn't do as well as expected in the labor market area because although we have high labor market participation rates, uh, many of the jobs that immigrants uh, obtain in this country are in kind of on the lower end of the occupational spectrum. So people working in the dirtiest and most dangerous jobs in the country. And then even on the high end of the occupational spectrum, as we'll mention in a moment, there are high levels of brain waste. In other words, people working far below uh, their educational level. So you may have a college degree, but you're working as a taxi driver. So for those reasons, and of course we have large numbers of people living in an undocumented status. So those are some of the considerations that pull down our ranking. Um, I thought it might be good at this point just to stop for a few questions you might have before we proceed with the rest of the webinar. So are, are there any questions that have popped up, Andrea, that uh, we should talk about at this moment? Um, yes, there are a few questions, and I just wanted to reiterate that you can submit questions via the chat or questions box on your webinar console. And also, just let us know if you're having any te technical difficulties. So we do have a question from Laura Zapola, and she wanted to know what is the fifth column activity? Also, what was the statistic in regards to the 40,000 nurses by year 2020? Uh, 
Sure. Uh, fifth column was a term that was uh, used extensively in the run-up to World War II, and it was a concern that there were uh, hidden uh, groups of pro-fascist, pro-Nazis active in the United States. So I kind of resurrected a term from the past. But it refers back to that period of time. The uh, 40,000 figure on nurses comes from a study that was done with funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. I can send you the exact reference if you'll just send me an email. I'll give you my email at the end of the presentation and send you the uh, link to the study. Great. And yeah. the next question comes from Zenaida Steinhauer. How, why was there a big drop in 2003 for legal immigrants entering New Jersey? Um, my guess is that that was a period of time when we uh, introduced uh, new uh, efforts to screen immigrants and refugees. So this was in the aftermath of the 9-11 tragedy. Uh, and that did slow uh, the number of refugees admitted to the United States, didn't stop the program. Um, so uh, my guess is that it's related to that, but that's a very good question. I'm not sure I have a clear answer for it. I'm guessing that it's related to some of the measures that were put in place after 9-11. Okay, and Laura Algaradas had a question regarding the rank and if that ranking was done before or after the ban that's not a ban. <laughs> it was done, done well before the ban that was not a ban. It's, uh, the ranking goes back to the early part of 2016, so it's a year old now. So good, so shall we continue then? Anything else, Andrea? Yes, yeah, so that's those are all the questions we have at this time. Okay, great. Let's let's continue. Well, we kind of come now to the meat of this presentation. What policies and practices have proven effective in advancing the goal of immigrant integration? Uh, obviously, we're going to have to be uh, rather selective in what we can cover in the limited time that we have. Uh, I should mention that the science on this is quickly evolving. This is a fairly new field of activity. And of course, you're going to get my perspective on the topic, which may not be the same as someone else's. How I th however, I think you'll get a good sense of this, uh, some of the main areas of work in this area. I've listed on this slide uh, 10 recommendations, kind of culled from the literature on integrant integration, and I think that are deserving of some mention. Um, these recommendations are kind of reflected in the MIPEX index. There may be some of, uh, you could describe them as some of the global areas of activity that are covered in greater depth in the MIPEX index and in other indexes of immigrant integration. So the first recommendation is um, Remember that immigrants in the United States are extremely diverse, not only in terms of their ethnic, racial, and religious background, but also in their socioeconomic characteristics. So we have to be very careful to avoid stereotyping immigrants or painting them with too broad a brush. And what I'd like to do is give you just three examples of immigrant diversity. And we're going to talk about language proficiency, education, and link, uh, legal status. Let's start with language proficiency. This slide looks at limited English proficiency from a national lens, and it's taken from a study that was done by the Census Bureau several years ago. It groups the states into three groups. States whose LEP percentages are significantly higher than the national average, uh, and the national average, by the way, is 50%. So if it's um, higher than the national average, then the state is showing in purple. If it's lower than the national average, the this, this state appears in green. And if it's at the uh, average, it's beige. You'll see that New Jersey falls into the states that are 
somewhat lower than the national average at 46 percent. So the national average is 50, our average is 46, but of course that still represents a hell of a lot of LEP immigrants in the state. So linguistic and cultural barriers are important obstacles to effective integration and must be addressed in any comprehensive integration strategy. One reason why there is variation among the states in, in their LEP percentages is the composition of the immigrant population. Now here we have a chart uh, showing the percentage of people who are limited English proficient for the 10 largest immigrant groups in New Jersey. What's interesting, I think, about this chart is that for eight of the ten groups, the average is much higher than the state average of 46 percent. For example, if you look at Mexicans, it's close to 80 percent. You've got four other Spanish-speaking countries where the LEP percentage is around two-thirds, and Korea, China, and Poland are in the low 50s. India and the Philippines are 31 and 27 percent, respectively. So clearly the large number of immigrants from India, which by the way is the number one country in terms of overall numbers in New Jersey, and the Philippines, the number six country, is moving New Jersey's overall LEP percentage downward. So clearly there's a huge need for language access services in New Jersey, especially for certain populations. And of course for agencies working in specific counties or communities, it would be good to have this data broken down for those local communities. Now the kinds of variations from one group to another that you see in this chart are in part related to education. So let's talk a little bit about how the educational background of immigrants varies. This chart gives you a profile of educational attainment for immigrants who are 25 years of age or over. The chart breaks down the adult population into five educational groups. Those with less than a high school diploma on the left, followed by people with a high school diploma, followed by those with some college or an associate degree. Then you get people with a bachelor's and finally on the right hand side, those with graduate or professional degrees. The red column is the percentage of the foreign born who fall into that educational category. The blue column is the corresponding native born percentage. Now there's one really very striking difference between the foreign born and the native born and that's the percentage of the foreign-born who are night house high school graduates, 21 percent compared to 9 percent for the native-born. This means that basic skills, education, and vocational training can serve as important pathways to living wage employment for this segment of the foreign-born. Another statistic that I'd like to call your attention to is the number of immigrants who have higher education. In fact, if you add up the bachelor's degree immigrants and the graduate degree immigrants, it's a total of 36 percent, which matches the native-born percentage. Now we shouldn't read too much into that number in that underemployment and unemployment are particularly high among immigrants with college degrees earned in other countries. Migration Policy Institute has calculated that there are more than 100,000 college-educated immigrants in New Jersey who are experiencing what they call brain waste, meaning they're working in low-skilled jobs or are unemployed. So when we look at integration strategies in education, we have to bear in mind the particular challenges confronting the foreign-born, whether on the lower end of the educational spectrum or on the upper end. For example, just to give you one example, the approach to teaching English for um, immigrants without a high school diploma is quite different from teaching English to those who have a college degree. We don't have time to get into that, but I just want to bring that to your attention. 
Now, one other area of a difference among immigrants is in the area of legal status. This chart shows the three major statuses of the foreign born. Naturalized citizens, and that's the green section, uh, slightly more than half the foreign born in New Jersey. Permanent residents, the blue section, that's about 400,000. And undocumented immigrants, the red section, a whopping half a million in New Jersey. In fact, New Jersey has the fifth largest undocumented population in the nation. We know from research that immigrants lacking status, indeed even immigrants lacking citizenship, operate under serious handicaps that limit their full participation in society. So that a society that de denies legal status and citizenship to a significant segment, segment of its population is probably asking for trouble in the future. However, uh, bear in mind that lack of legal status is likely to be a greater po problem among certain groups than others. This chart shows you the five largest unauthorized populations in New Jersey, and it's based on the latest data from the Migration Policy Institute. Together, these five groups make up about half the undocumented in New Jersey. So what I'd like you to remember from these few slides is that good data, as granular as possible, will be very useful to you in designing appropriate services and supports for whatever segment of the immigrant population you're targeting. Be especially wary of stereotyping immigrants and making false generalizations about them, as immigrants are probably as diverse as the American population as a whole. Let's return now to our list of 10 recommendations, and we're going to get to the second rec recommendation, which for some of you, I'm sure, will be preaching to the choir and that is the importance of cultural competency in the delivery of services and supports to the immigrant population. Cultural competency provides a kind of conceptual framework and a kind of roadmap for organizations interested in advancing the goal of immigrant integration. However, it must be pursued at multiple levels, not just at the individual level, or the level of the practitioner, but also at the organizational and systems level. One example of this kind of comprehensive approach to cultural competency is the national class standards of the Office of Minority Health, class standing for culturally and linguistically appropriate services. These 15 standards are grouped into three categories. Governance, leadership, and workforce issues, number one. Communication issues, number two. <clears throat> and engagement and accountability issues, number three. If you're not familiar with the class standards, I'd encourage you to review them, even if you're not a healthcare practitioner, because I think they have application uh, for other fields of service. They can be adapted for use by uh, people in other fields. Here's another way to visualize a systems approach to cultural competency. This chart is taken from work that we undertook several years ago in the state of Pennsylvania to identify the most critical elements of a culturally competent strategy for delivering services to immigrants with disabilities. We visualize these 10 elements as the spokes in a wheel. If you remove one or more of them, you would weaken the entire structure. So for example, we included the importance of sound public policy, the commitment and support of high level leadership, and the need to recruit qualified bilingual and multilingual personnel. I've included the reference on this slide if you want to look up the full report. Recommendation number three concerns the language barrier, and of course communication has special significance in any conversation about immigrants, given the large numbers that are not proficient in English. So building organizational capacity to overcome the language barrier is a key requirement 
for immigrant integration in human services and in other fields. Um, what does this mean in practical terms? Well, of course, we don't have time today to, to explore this issue in great depth. Um, the network has already sponsored and archived a great webinar on best practices in language services conducted by Hank Delman. So I'd encourage you to watch that webinar for more information on this subject. What I will stress at this point would be careful consideration of what are called the various modalities for delivering language services. Four of them classified here as proximate, meaning that the act of interpreting is provided on site, and two classified as remote, where the interpreter is off site and co connected to the client either by telephone, telephone or video. Each modality has its usefulness and application, but they are not always interchangeable. For example, you wouldn't want to use telephone inter interpreting for sharing bad news or end-of-life scenarios. With all of these modalities, it is absolutely imperative that the person providing interpreting services is trained and qualified to do so. This is especially important for staff members acting as dual role interpreters or, or who, for staff members who are actually providing services in foreign language. Being able to converse in a foreign language doesn't necessarily mean that you have sufficient command of the language to act as an interpreter. And even if you have sufficient command of the language, that doesn't mean that you actually know how to interpret. So I'm emphasizing here the importance of using trained and qualified personnel to interpret. The final point made on this slide is that the language barrier can also be overcome by helping adults learn English as quickly as possible so that they can reach a point when they may not need any kind of language accommodation. And of course this is a whole discussion in and of itself. How do you provide uh, language uh, learning opportunities for the immigrant population, both on the adult level and the pre-K to 12 level. So let's now talk about the fourth recommendation, which concerns the value of partnerships and coalitions. Um, immigrant community-based organizations can provide a valuable role to all of us us interested in the goal of immigrant integration. These organizations are an expression of, let's say, the self-help or the mutual assistance impulse within immigrant communities. But they can also serve as a resource to other more mainstream organizations. For one thing, they serve as a way of gaining insight into the needs of immigrants in local communities. They help us in achieving effective outreach to those communities, and they provide a range of supportive services. So that's my first point. The second point here is that um, there are many organizations that have already come together to work on immigrant integration issues. I've listed a few of these collaborations on this slide. The New Jersey Alliance for Immigrant Justice is a coalition of some 25 organizations working on immigrants' rights issues in the state. The Alliance participates in something called the National Partnership for New Americans, which is a national grouping of some 37 regional immigrant rights groups. Then you have CCCIE, the Community College Consortium for Immigrant Education, which does great work. The, imprint, the Imprints Coalition, which specialize, specializes in helping immigrant uh, professionals trained in other countries. Then you have Welcoming America, which is a grouping of some 75 cities and counties that are working together to promote immigrant integration at the municipal level. Cities for Citizenship and the Immigrant Advocates Network. I don't have time to, to give you details about those coalitions. But I just want, want you to be aware that these groups and others are in existence and can be a resource to you in your work. The fifth recommendation concerns the importance of economic integration. 
for giving immigrants the tools to succeed in our economy. Now, there are many ways to do this, and we can only skim the surface of this vital area of activity. On this slide, I mentioned several of these opportunities. The first involves opening up existing training programs for immigrant adults. I'll just share one quick statistic with you. In 2014, only 2% 2 of adults receiving Title I funded intensive training service in New Jersey were limited English proficient. Profession. Clearly, we have a lot more work to do in this area. And fortunately, there are other states that are pioneering in the development of new immigrant training models, which could be utilized here in New Jersey. Another fruitful area of activity is support for immigrant entrepreneurs. The immigrant entrepreneurship rate is already much higher than that of the native born, but so is the business failure rate. Immigrants face a number of obstacles, many of which can be overcome through effective programming. Fortunately, we do have some organizations in New Jersey that are working in this area. I'll mention the Statewide Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and Rising Tide Capital in Jersey City that are helping both existing and aspiring immigrant entrepreneurs. And finally, there is the brain waste problem that I mentioned earlier. Uh, over the last decade, many cities, states, and communities have taken on this challenge and developed innovative and promising new programs targeting this segment of the immigrant population. I'm not aware of any initiatives yet in New Jersey to help immigrant professionals, although uh, the State Employment and Training Commission just submitted a report on this subject to the State uh, uh, Employment Commission and hopefully we'll see some good work uh, emerging in this area. We now come to uh, the sixth recommendation, which is probably the most controversial, and especially in light of what's happening in Washington these days. I suppose the best way to say this um, is the following. If, if the choice comes down to legalization and remaining out of status, and if mass deportation is either impractical or undesirable, and if the goal is truly immigrant integration, then legalization is the better public policy option. And as this slide suggests, without legalization, many millions of people are consigned to the lowest rungs of the economic ladder with few opportunities to advance. At the same time, the entire system of worker protections is put in jeopardy as people are reluctant to assert their rights in the workplace for fear of deportation. And this problem of legal status isn't just a concern for the 11, the 11 and a half million who are undocumented, but it's also for people living in what are called mixed status families. I'm talking about wives, husbands, and children who are legal residents or citizens who also suffer because of the limited opportunities available to their undocumented family members. Finally, this slide points out that there are clear gains to be realized for legal residents or green card holders who advance to citizenship after the required five-year waiting period. The Center for the Study of Immigrant Integration at the University of Southern California has done some important research in this area, documenting the improvements in income and well-being that occurs with attainment of citizenship. And of course, when you're a citizen, you can participate in the political process. And if, and if that is an important outcome and an important measure for immigrant integration, citizenship uh, is something that we should strive to promote. Um, now, the seventh recommendation is derived from the field of social psychology and is known as the contact hypothesis, which suggests that um, people who interact with another, one another get to know and trust one another and become less fearful of each other. There are many, many examples of groups and programs that are putting this principle into action. One organization that has promoted this kind of work is Welcoming America, which has produced a series of toolkits to help local communities develop dialogue projects between native-born and foreign-born. 
their toolkits give examples of successful programs in various parts of the country. Let me just give you one example. Uh, they talk about the work of interfaith coalitions. Um, for example, there's one in Louisville, Kentucky called the Center for Interfaith Relations, which brings together, together Christian, Jewish, and Muslim leaders to work on community betterment projects. Fairfield University in Connecticut has developed a discussion guide to, to be used by Catholic parishes interested in promoting dialogue between immigrant and non-immigrant parishioners. Another example is a synagogue in Boise, Idaho, and here you see an image of someone working there. It happens to be the oldest synagogue west of the Mississippi River, and it's turned over a portion of its four-acre site to local refugees to be used as a community garden to grow home country vegetables. Another example are the cultural exchange forums that are sponsored by the Federation of Families in West Palm Beach and take place at the local library. Uh, these are featured on the website of the National Center for Cultural Competence. So, as we think about the advantages to be gained through dialogue projects, let's also remember that integration happens in a wide range of locations, including parks, sports venues, schools, interactions with law enforcement, libraries, and immigrant community organizations. We don't have time to cover each of these areas separately, but I'd like you to be aware of the fact there's actually a literature discussing how people active in these various spheres of activity can promote immigrant integration. For example, the Vera Institute for Justice in New York sponsors what's called the Engaging Police in Immigrant Communities, or EPIC project. This is a national effort to identify and assess promising law enforcement practices that cultivate trust and collaboration with immigrant communities. And they produce some excellent reports that are available on their website. Now we come to the ninth uh, area, the ninth recommendation, and this is critically important. It recognizes that misinformation and scapegoating have marred discussions of immigration throughout American history. And that if we're going to make progress in this area, we have to insist on accuracy in media coverage of immigrant related topics. At the same time, it's important to produce and disseminate the research necessary to support responsible policy development in this field. Whether we're talking about admission policy, how to make immigration a win-win for everyone in this country, and what strategies and approaches have proven most effective in immigrant integration. I'm not saying to construct a biased narrative but it should be a truthful narrative that reflects the best research available uh, on the subject. And now we get to the tenth and final recommendation concerning the kind of leadership and coordination necessary to develop and implement an immigrant integration strategy. Because this is a specialized area, it's hard to give it the attention and professionalism it requires without creating responsibility centers for immigrant integration. This applies to all levels of government and to the private sector. It's one reason why President Obama set up his task force on new Americans in November of 2014 to coordinate the work of some 14 federal agencies in advancing the goal of immigrant integration. Now these types of initiatives, the establishment of centers of leadership and coordination are cropping up all over the country and I've listed just a few of them in this slide. They exist on the state, city, county, and nonprofit level. Two examples on the state level are the Michigan Office uh, for New Americans and the New York State Office for New Americans. Two examples on the municipal level are the Seattle Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs and the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs in New York City. 
One example on the county level is the Gilchrist Resource Center in Montgomery County, Maryland, it's in the suburbs of Washington. And another model in the nonprofit space is the Welcoming Center for New Pennsylvanians, which has as its goal connecting immigrants to the services and supports that they need to advance in American society. I've listed on this slide a few great resources that might be of use to you. The American Immigrant Policy Portal is something that we produce. It, pro it produces summaries of all the important uh, publicly accessible research on topics related to immigrant integration. If you go to the home page, you can sign up to receive um, our monthly newsletter. Uh, this is a project that, that I do in collaboration with the School of Social Work at Rutgers, the Immigrant Learning Center, and researchers that contribute abstracts of this research on a monthly basis. The European website on integration does the same thing, but of course it has a focus on the European Union. I'm mentioning also cities of migration, which emphasizes the importance of migration to the vitality and prosperity of cities. This website has a section called Good Ideas in Integration, which is a collection of city-level practices that have proven effective in promoting immigrant integration. Welcoming America, as I mentioned earlier, focuses on creating the conditions for immigrant and community success by building up a network of communities working together. There are roughly 75 cities and counties now that are participating in New Jersey in, uh, in this network nationally. Regrettably, we have only one so far in New Jersey. Uh, kudos to Princeton for being part of this network. At the present time, Welcoming America is working on developing a set of standards for communities interested in being designated welcoming communities. Finally, the Migration Policy Institute has something called the National Center on Immigrant Integration Policy which undertakes research on best practices in immigrant integration work and has a website with a wealth of useful information. Um, I know I've had to uh, rush through a lot of material. Uh, I hope you will consider this to be an overview of the area. Perhaps in some future webinars we can cover some of these topics in greater depth. Um, we uh, would welcome any suggestions that you might have and I think we have a few minutes now for questions, and if we can't get to your questions before the end of the time for the webinar, uh, I'll try to do my best to answer them offline. Thank you for your attention. Yes, and thank you, Nick, for a great presentation. We have a few questions. Um, Lauren Agaratis asks, what can be done regarding the recent ARC alert? based on the Washington Post, that immigrants with disabilities will not be allowed in, and if someone is here less than five years and becomes, becomes disabled, will be deported, and provided at a, she provided a link to the article. Uh, I, I appreciate your providing the link, and I think I'd like to share it. This is um, a very serious concern. Um, and I should say that it's also a concern to the extent that this country attempts to model any immigration reform on what's happening not south of the border but north of the border. I'm talking about Canada. Canada is often cited as a model for responsible immigration policy, but there's one very great lapse in their policy and that is that they uh, have instituted policies which prevent people with disabilities from emigrating to Canada. Uh, I think we need to fight against any effort to do something similar here. Uh, and this is the first time that I've heard that as part of um, proposals that are being prepared that there would be some effort to limit the entry of people with disabilities. That is very concerning to me and I'm sure it's concerning to other people in the audience. Any other questions? Thank you. And it looks like our last uh, question um, by Judith Nelson is, will this presentation be available as a handout after the webinar? Um, well, 
uh, as uh, as you mentioned earlier, the presentation will be archived and put up on the uh, website, and I'd be happy to make a copy available to anyone who's interested. Okay, and it looks like your email address is located on the screen. Yeah, I have the email right up there. Okay, so on behalf of the NJSNCC, I want to thank you for attending this webinar. It will be archived and made available. Please don't forget to complete the survey, which will appear on the screen once we end the webinar. Thank you.